Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Critical Infrastructure a Cyber Physical Battlefield Session. My name is Gabor Wischke. I'm from the CCD COA, where I work as a researcher for the technology branch. My main field of interest is the industrial control systems I tackle with Cyber Physical Battlefield. This panel will also deal with this, these topics. In this session, we will first have a closer look into the cyber threats to telecom networks by Mikko Karikite. Then we dig deeper into science and technology. Our next panelist, Mr. Junzo Kim, takes us to the world of designing, construction, and use of cyber, physical, uh, cyber battlefields. Our third panelist, Professor Takela, will give us the opportunity to learn more about how to measure the resilience of a cyber physical system. Before we kick off, just a couple of words about the format of our panel. Just like the previous one, we have uh, an hour and a half, and we've got three speakers. Each and every speaker will have uh, 20 minutes. After the, their presentation, we are going to have some questions from the floor. So please consider coming up with some uh, really good questions. In the end, we will uh, have some questions. We will have some minutes to wrap up the panel or shed light uh, on questions from different perspectives. I realize that not everyone here has the English as their first language. So I would like you to structure your questions and limit yourself to one or two key points, possibly avoiding the multi-layered, mega deep questions. So our first panelist, Mr. Karikite from uh, Ericsson, who is the head of Ericsson Network Security. He has got the best security experts in his team at Ericsson. The task is to protect Ericsson's network so that we can keep enjoying our digital way of life. Mikko, the floor is yours. Please. Thank you. So this is the clicker. Hi, all. Very happy to be here. My name is Mikko Karigut, as you heard. I'm heading Ericsson Network Security. We are dealing with product security issues, product privacy issues, and then security technologies for the whole portfolio of Ericsson. So one thing why I'm speaking here is that we are also operating the product security incident response team uh, in the Ericsson group, which means that we also see and hear many types of things in all the regions. But telecommunication networks, why are they interesting? Well, I think that many of you would have a, certainly a different type of trip to Tallinn if you didn't have a mobile working mobile telephone uh, network here. Would you, wouldn't you agree with me? So what we all also, even in Ericsson, at times we forget to mention, because it's so evident for us and it's so obvious for us, that telecommunication network is actually a rather good platform. If you compare it with any other arbitrary or uh, ID system or network, tele telecommunications network has some features that make it actually unique. We start with standards and regulation. From the beginning of the uh, uh, first generations of telecommunications networks, they have been standardized globally and agreed commonly. The, the security, the protocols, the algorithms that we use, they have been same for most places. But at least you have always had the option that you can travel wherever you want and you will have calls and mobile data nowadays, obviously. And that is a beautiful thing. Second thing that makes it also remarkable is that the communication has a rather strong encryption. Since 4G, it has been quite good, actually. Third thing is that uh, the telecommunication nodes, in many cases, have hardware rules of trust. So we tend to say that we have trust from silicon to service. So you can, you can argue that if you set up any other network from components that you get uh, uh, from, from random places, you might have to assure much more that the whole platform is as trustworthy as a telecommunications network today. We have always had something we call strong ident identities, so SIM cards, you know, is actually a rather unique feature of, of uh, if you compare it to other types of networks and uh, uh, network devices 
because we actually have a hardware token that we know exactly what is the identity in the other end. And that is something different uh, that we might forget. And for these reasons also, these days, a telecommunications network actually works quite well for industrial solutions also. Let's look at the 5G in the future. But why and how do we actually make these networks globally work together and actually secure? So we want to think in Ericsson that we have four layers in the whole setup. It all starts with the standardization. As I said in the beginning, we agree commonly that what are the protocols, how does the network in interoperate, and, uh, and how do we secure them. Secondly comes my part. Uh, I'm responsible of leading the uh, product security development across the company. So we are going to do so that the, sec the hardware and software coming out of our uh, supply lines is actually secure, tested, assured, and uh, architecture is, is fit for the purpose, and it is uh, uh, d designed and, and defined for the, the critical infrastructure use. The second or third thing is actually, which is quite critical, is also the deployment process. And now we're talking about like things like architecturing. So how we actually set up the network together with the customer, the operator, we design the systems, and we put them in the use, and we configure them. And this is this second or third phase where we could make mistakes. If you think like, if you don't pay attention in the architecture phase and the deployment phase, you may actually leave a, a door open or you may have a configuration mistake or a default password in place, for example. In my experience, the most, ex the most important part of the security anyway comes in the last phase, when the networks are actually operated. In the incidents, what we see the many times the gaps are in the operational procedures. So we say that the, the operations procedures, actually the sec secure operational procedures, segregation of duties, the least privilege, like very simple basic security things, many of you know, at least if you have ever done any IT security job, you know about these privileges. So these are still very topical uh, items to, to be discussed. Monitoring of the security performance is also quite important going to also the visibility that you actually see that if you have threat actors and you can respond on them. So we see that the security of the whole telecom uh, environment is built for, from these four layers. And any of these layers can fail or could fail, and then you might get into trouble. In my personal opinion, I think that the, the, the most important layer is the last one, the outer layer, because there you can still ruin anything good that was made before you started operating the network. But why, why is it uh, so important that we protect the tele telecommunications network? What is there that is interesting for threat actors? <coughs> the first thing that what we see very much is money. So as long as the mobile phone calls and the mobile data actually cost money, it will be interesting for people, especially in certain regions where the value uh, uh, related to the maybe income level is uh, certainly high. So you will have fraud cases, you might have insider fraud or, or people trying to actually abuse the charging and billing systems from outside to get free calls and get free data. So this is one of the very big uh, issues I think is globally reported uh, to, to be the uh, plaguing the telecom operators. In some other regions then roaming fraud is a very common uh, way of uh, printing money, abusing the system. But one of the more important and interesting things from my own point of view is the information. Because what does a telecommunication network actually include? So, so that your phone in your pocket can, uh, can ring when you're called, it actually has to know where you, you are. So it has your location at any given time. It also has information about who are you calling, who are you, when are you calling, what are you talking and what are you saying, what are you texting and so on. So this information, as you very, very well understand, is quite uh, precious and quite interesting for many actors. Third thing, and this is now my categorization also, you can disagree completely and we can have a discussion later. But the third uh, category I put these incidents or breaches in is the, uh, the actual service of the infrastructure. So sabotage, bringing the actual network down, and then you're not having any service. You know, are you losing money or are you losing information, but you are not having a service. 
So that is the third case that what we see often. If we look at the uh, very high level description of a current telecommunications network, how it's actually structured often these days, we can split it in three main domains. We have the core network that is kind of the brains of the, the network. It contains all the information about the subscribers. It knows your numbers. It knows your address. It knows who, who are you connected and when and how. Then you have the access network, which is actually then the visible part that you see on the rooftops and bus, bus stops, etc. the antennas in the landscape. You have the radio access network there. Then you have the management layer. And this is the layer where the IT admins or the, the, the operator admins will connect their computers and then be accessing and updating, maintaining, patching, and, and doing uh, configuration and rolling out new sites, etc. Uh, for the whole network. And, uh, Based on the piece or the experiences, we can see threats coming uh, to all these domains. Firstly, of course, the access network is interesting. So this would be the place where a very traditional radio jamming that is kind of a simple, stupid uh, way of just blocking people out of, out of the service, or then uh, rogue base stations, which uh, then obviously are in some law enforcement cases are legal uh, way of uh, actually spying on what people are saying. These are more valid in the older generations of uh, the networks. In 4G and 5G, it, it will be a different case. Then, the, uh, as uh, the networks are global, you will have the other networks. So obviously, for you, your citizens to be able to call the other citizens in different countries or travel uh, uh, other side of the world and still have your mobile service, you will need to connect to other networks. So these other networks then are sending packages and sending uh, uh, information and data to your network. So this is a, a threat uh, scenario that we also often see. So you could uh, nowadays, you, you can have an access to signaling network, uh, paid access to signaling network, and uh, do malicious activities there, trying to retrieve, for example, information of subscribers. And this is, of course, mostly effective in the older generations, 2G and 3G. One that is quite an interesting scenario, what I find, and maybe more uh, applicable also uh, in, in interest of, of you guys, is the management layer. So this would be the threat actor that will be coming to the office space or leaving their USB sticks in the parking lot and just infecting the office ID, uh, desktop, laptop, and then laterally move and find those people and those computers who have access to the management layer of the telecom network. And from there, they would start uh, investigating the network, researching where the, the crown jewels are, planting their scripts, planting their software, uh, replacing the software if they like, if they can, and wait. And then they would wait for the right time, and then they would act when it's timely. So I think that this uh, management layer is one of the layers when I speak to people, to our customers, and internally with our guys, I always emphasize that we should never, we should never underestimate the threat into the OATM layer. We have seen examples of all these cases. We see these in all regions. We see uh, scenarios where uh, we find scripts in the networks that are planted uh, to do their stuff. They might be extracting information from the core network. They might be bringing the network down, uh, bringing tens of radio sites at the same time down, uh, or then just printing money, as I said, in the fraud, case of fraud. Then, as we're living in 2019, and 5G is a big topic, when we are going to very near future and connecting even more of the industries and connecting the rest of the society who has not yet found the light and haven't been uh, in the, in the uh, real-time uh, wireless uh, cellular connection, we will have obviously very interesting scenarios. In one of the keynotes today, I think that there was very good uh, points about uh, connected cars and a few other things that we also have to be very carefully protecting when we think that we put them to uh, platforms like this. Obviously, the telecommunications network provides a quite secure uh, baseline for, for running whatever you have, mission critical. 
So then, if we look back into our books and see, like, why, why, why is it that these threat actors are successful at times, and why do they actually get hold of the information they shouldn't get, or why do they are, why are they able to print money or bring things down? So the most common reasons behind security breaches and incidents, what we see in, in Ericsson P cert. So, firstly, quite the classic, I think uh, you can recognize it probably. The security policy, if it exists, is not enforced or it's not monitored. So people actually might implement changes, they might change configuration, no one is following them up. People are not using strong passwords or they are not applying the password policy or they are not using uh, encryption in the uh, rest or in transit. The current operational pro procedures, which are human behavior, which are human act, is not always the best. As I have been speaking in some AI conferences, I say that the first thing that AI will do is to remove, eliminate the human from, the, uh, from this uh, picture, because the human is the biggest risk for the tele uh, telecommunications network security. It's so easy to delegate access by just handing out your, share your password or handing out your, uh, your keys and, or, or delegating access in, in a ways that it should not be. It's also easy to open a door, leave a port open for test purposes, and then forget about it. And in the end, then you, you will find it three years later, and then you still have a gap in the security of the network. Lack of hardening and insecure configuration of the network. So as we do have in many places in the world, we have a lot of history with uh, uh, these networks. We have a lot of legacy also. So we have good reasons also to make them interconnect and make them work together. So that brings a, a potential that we also might actually just forget that we have that telnet running in there, or that we have those un other unsecure services running in the platform before we are upgrading into the newer uh, versions. So it is a very common reason for why we have a security incident is that the configuration is just not brought into the today. And then when things go wrong, uh, most often when I personally also have been in a, in a, a venue where the, an incident has happened and been leading an investigation, the lack of visibility to these networks is immense. So you, if you are logging, and I, I come to the uh, incident uh, uh, interview with a, a technical administrator of a network and I ask her, so, okay, so you have had a breach here, can we see the logs? And they are like, no. Okay, so do you have logs? Yeah. Okay, why can't we see them? We don't know how to get them. Uh-huh. So it's very basic IT security things that are still failing when the incidents happen. Of course, we have super good examples, but the bad examples are getting to this slide. In Ericsson, then, when we are trying to help our customers and, and nations to actually run these services secure so that the citizens have a good life and the digital society is running like it's planned, we start using uh, things like, uh, or communicating through trust stack, for example. So this is kind of in the sync with those four layers what we had before. So we believe that, of course, the common standardization and uh, regulation is the key that we have a trusted uh, common agreement about how the network should look. Then the hardware and software, which is the part that we deliver, that has to be secure and it has to be free uh, of exploitable vulnerabilities. Then the deployment part, again, the architecture and the blueprint of the network, how it's set up, that is a, a very important part and, and one of those parts that could fail. But then the trusted operations, the appropriate procedures and the le principles of least privilege and uh, segregation of duties and uh, timely patching and uh, password management, access control, you name it. That trusted operations layer is super important in this picture. And then only then you will have a trusted business and you will have a well-working trusted digital society. And obviously both sides, uh, the, the bottom parts enable the, the top parts to function and vice versa. There are needs coming from top to down. We have developed our own security reliability model. What we are handling internally in our R&D, all parts important for delivering secure nodes and secure networks. So, it's not only uh, limited to functions, so that all the network nodes should have functionality like logging, access control, access management, 
and whatnot, firewalling, etc. But then also that they are assured that the security assurance testing, hands-on penetration testing, hacking, uh, privacy impact assessments are done timely, continuously, and, and, and uh, on a good standard level. Documentation so that the actual operator can actually use the, uh, the device or the network in a way that is secure in the future also. And then those services that are complementing uh, our customers to get to a, a secure state. So we take this end to end, we take it very seriously. We build it from bottom up, uh, built in security and privacy. But then I had, for the end of my presentation, for this short time that we have today, I thought few things that um, what should we take into account that we also make the secure, uh, the future secure for these networks. And thinking again, especially this uh, system that we are connecting industrial uh, factories, uh, automotive, uh, boats, whatsoever, uh, connecting them to, to our networks. So one thing that I see that is, is going to happen uh, next is the automation to minimize the operational security uh, failures. Because really, the human is the weakest link in the picture. So more we can automate and more we can, the orchestration and management of these security policies, the monitoring of the devices when we can automate it, make the reporting uh, very um, uh, interactive and, and, and human readable, the better. The standards, we still believe that the, we need to have common standards. Uh, possibly also when we look at IoT, some of those critical components that we are connecting to the networks, they might need to be certified. So we can actually have some uh, idea about what is running there in the uh, network. Today we know, we know how the cell phone is. We know exactly that's standardized and that's regulated very high level. So we know exactly what are those devices that are in the cellular network. So we have to keep that same uh, level of quality also in the future. Then from PCERT learnings and PCERT point of view, we understand that collaboration platforms, information sharing, like events like this and many more are super important, as well as of course the real-time threat intelligence sharing. It's much better to learn from other one's mistakes than trying to go all the mistakes through yourself. We also believe that when we have the variety of different devices going to the network, it's not only enough to trust that the endpoints can actually se secure themselves. So we need to have network-based security controls with predictive capabilities, getting back to the discussion of what we had in this room before about AI and machine learning. And in the end, this is my personal point. I hope you all agree. I think the security must come from magic to basic. It shouldn't be so anymore that you have that gang in your company or organization who are magical security wizards, and they will save the planet when everything goes wrong. It should actually be on the agenda of each and every one. I say that the uh, biggest service you can, as a, as a leader or a manager, can do for the threat actor is never ask your security team how are they doing? This should be on everybody's agenda, and I hope that we get to that point soon. Thank you. This is all I have today. Mikko, thank you very much for your comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, it was very, very interesting for me. I suppose that uh, you've got uh, great questions. Tons of them. No, most probably, most probably they have. Uh, but um, well, it's important the uh, topic because uh, right. most of you use the phone day by day, and and uh, you don't think that it's a kind of uh, critical infrastructure mm. element. Well, uh, I'm sure you've got uh, kind of statistical data about the security breaches. Uh, they are most probably confidential, kind of? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not prepared to share any uh, details about uh, any geographical uh, kind of uh, split between different types of incidents, but uh, I can say that at least what we see from PZERT, uh, PZERT point of view, in, in the last 10 years, I, I must say that the large majority of all incidents, what we investigate, come down to those operational procedures. Of course, software has to be patched, and you might have a contribution by uh, a lacking patch, for example, in, in the, but the, the operational procedure is very simple things. I have been seeing a scenario where a system has been completely breached and been abused for years, 
and that was due to uh, uh, sharing the credentials between a, a group of uh, almost 20 people. So it's, 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 it is very simple things. I, I think th those are like, uh, they say, hygiene level uh, factors. So we can say that uh, there is uh, one common route of mm. main route for the security. Yeah, that should be the long, long, low hanging fruit. Thanks. Do we have a question here? Yeah, and uh, Raimo Patterson okay. from yeah. TCD Siri, <laughs> very welcome to this Yeah, question. thank you for introduction. Yes, I just saw that Saran, there is opportunity to ask questions, fine. Um, I really much liked your classification of the security mm. breaches. Okay, you first you had sir, this um, standardization, then okay, and a standardization deployment. I don't mm. remember exactly. Yeah. And then yeah. in other slide, okay, the motivation, what was uh, um, money, and also mm. then the information, information and leakage, and all that, and yeah. different groups. And okay, but my question is that. It looks me currently mm. is that the mobile networks are currently in, in a, a kind of breakthrough phase. Mm. Sorry, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm. And I mean that, that they are going to be virtual networks, virtualized. Mm. Before we had box-based mm. solutions, and now it's going to be virtualized. Yep. And another thing what I see currently which is changing is uh, eSIM. Um, mm. I don't know if it has impact or not, but maybe if you can a little bit elaborate what impact, these two changes, what I mentioned, what impact do they have into these groups mm. of what, what, I, what you show there? Mm. Does it change anything? Or, or I mean, so do we have a better or more complex attacks against of, I don't know, mm. uh, confidentiality mm. because of that or something like that? Mm. Uh, very interesting questions. Uh, firstly, the, the virtualization, um, that's actually something, it's almost like old school already. We have had a our products virtualized for so many years. Uh, I know that, of course, uh, customers are deploying them still today and, and going to increase that as, as we speak. Uh, at least from an uh, incident response point of view, you can, you can say that maybe you have an interesting time finding logs when you have everything in the, in running in the cloud or, or in, in a virtualized uh, environment. But uh, other than that, I think it's, it's a resilient uh, and, uh, and a, a, a very well, when it's secured well, it's a secure solution, and I have I have good trust for the uh, virtualization platforms. Uh, then uh, the secondly, if we if you think about the um, eSIM or the the kind of kind of those type of identities, well, obviously those are developed for different types of use cases. So so now in in cell phone you will have a SIM card, and that's fine and good and dandy for that, and uh, it works. No reason to change that much. Uh, the the eSIM then I think that the, the biggest um, uh, implication for for us in, in the security is that then we will have a, a ton of different types of devices running in the network and uh, makes it much more very much more the the types of issues. So uh, I see that it will be much more colorful rainbow in the in the in the future. But other than that, I. I I don't have any comment on security of the eSIM, then I would have to get one of my deep technical experts here. I just meant maybe between deployments there are some yeah. differences or something like that. Let's get back to that later. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I saw that uh, there were some more questions. Uh, please uh, put it back and uh, let's have the next uh, speaker. Uh, Dr. Uh, Junzu Kim is a senior researcher at the North uh, South, South Korean National Research uh, Institute. Junzu's current, current research is focused on the cyber exercises. He wants to know how to design, build up, and operate an effective national cyber security exercise. His research has a multidisciplinary approach, although he's, he has uh, his PhD in electrical, and computer engineering. Please introduce your presentation. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jun Soo Kim uh, from National Security Research Institute, South Korea. <laughs> 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 yeah, sorry. <laughs> and uh, today's talk is more like an engineering report, and it does not sound really cool or deep, and that is true. But I hope this talk, I mean, I can share the fundamental but practical design considerations we always had in mind in constructing our own cyber physical battlefield platform for large scale cybersecurity exercises. 
So I, don't, I do not need to re-emphasize re the importance of defending critical infrastructures. The omnipotence of the ICT technologies also defines the unlimited power of uh, malicious cyber attacks. Uh, and critical infrastructures, CIs, I mean, as cyber physical battlefields, is where that is mostly, most dramatically uh, affected. Therefore, for national or international exercises, having the CPBs in their scenarios or in technical setups is becoming a big uh, trend and more, more like a must-have element nowadays. <clears throat> and based on that, we want to simulate the critical uh, damage to the national infrastructures that can cause significant impact on nation or society. And we also involved all the cyber stakeholders uh, to fight against that public institutions, military, uh, national CI operators, uh, private uh, companies, among others. And we want to, within this exercise, we, we want to test true national readiness in well-ordered coordination, cooperation across all the cyber stakeholders uh, under the worst cyber crisis situation. And we also want this exercise it's a great opportunity to develop or improve uh, the national, a comprehensive national cybersecurity strategy. That is our goal uh, as an exercise planner. And in the ideal situation, uh, exercise planning team will discuss what kind of the critical infrastructure sectors we're going to implement in the upcoming uh, exercise. And one main determining factor uh, for the selection will be uh, whether we can provide some decision challenges to exercise participants based on the wide spectrum of adversaries cyber operation consequences in scope, in duration, or in intensity. And we know we, there's a great framework for that, uh, the use of force assessment as described in Tallinn Manual. And these are the factors to consider in assessing that. And we want to create scenarios that each criterion shown here uh, become an uh, adjustable parameter. Think of it as a volume control knob so that the, with our prepared scenario, we can maximize the variation of it. This is important because, as you all know, that the, the nature of the use of force or armed attack uh, is unsettled. And to have that, um, we need a hostile CPB exercise environment. Uh, for example, we want to visualize the different level of the severity of the physical consequences caused by the cyber operations. And we want the timing of the representation of that uh, can be com controllable depending on the developing exercise progress. But in the meantime, in the real life we are living in, there's the, the, in the middle of it, there's Mr. Kim, the security researcher and exercise planner. And uh, he came up with a realistic uh, simulation mock-up system uh, that all of his team's researches, efforts, and capabilities were put on. And there were, of course, there were many restrictions. There were some secret the attributions, attributes to consider so that the, they were, had to be really careful not to reveal any confidential information while they are developing that. And obvi obviously, there was a budget limitation. But the problem is that the, the devices or software in these fields are really expensive or too big or too heavy or not even accessible or not even purchasable. So there was some kind of idea of using some general purpose device like Arduinos or Raspberry Pi, but uh, they, uh, that idea was dropped because there are opinions that they are not realistic. There are some other kind of opinion, I mean, ideas that the virtualizing all the systems based on the softwares and to 
increase the flexibility of the system, and to reduce the cost. But again, that idea was dropped because the, again, that, that's, they say they, not, they are not realistic. And this is the size of physical system, so that there should be some physical representation about it. And Mr. Kim thought himself that the, the sense of uh, reality is really, really relative here. And, uh, but in spite of the, these adversities, he came up with some setup that he can be really proud of. But there was an internal review right after that. There's a boss. Boss came and complained. It doesn't look cool. It's smaller than the one of the neighbor institute. It cost me a lot of money. And please find a way to reuse it for broad audience even though the initial plan was to have a really customized, realistic simulation setup for targeted groups. So that uh, he had a, went to the external review. His system was based on the site X, but he, he it turns out that the site Y has totally different configuration based on the systems from different vendors. When the, this system was presented to the exercise, and the exercise participants there are coming from different backgrounds, IT specialists, and people from some different CI sectors are complaining, I don't, want, I don't uh, understand why I have to spend time to study all this realistic setup. In a particular area, they don't really care. And the poor Mr. Kim is now thinking of quitting his job. <laughs> so this is the reality he's facing. These are the, some CPB exercise environment I found uh, on the internet or the ex ex exhibitions. And I guess the, these systems developers have gone through similar mind procedures I just described. Uh, the effectiveness of the greatness of each system for their purposes is not debatable, at least in my humble position. But I can com comment on what we have developed. In the cybersecurity training and exercise center that I'm also involved in Korea, I also have a critical infrastructure cyber range. And it also has great setup. But it's not scalable, it's not mobile, it's not extensible. It has been great for offline exercises, but it's not suitable for the large scale exercise. We are trying to encompass all the cyber stakeholders, national cyber stakeholders. So we thought, excuse me, we need uh, some platform, a universal platform, exercise platform uh, that has a lot of technical means to simulate various types of the CI sectors. Instead of starting from scratch for every sector, coming up with totally different setup, so making them hard to get integrated. On the same platform, we want to uh, stack up different elements of the critical infrastructure sectors so that the inter-sector uh, kind of integration can be seamlessly enabled. Basically, we want to build some gravity to pull all the newly developed cyber physical systems around this platform so that we can foster some continuous innovation uh, with accumulated knowledge and eventually heading toward the complete national portfolio about critical infrastructures. Uh, Thinking of that, on the plane coming here uh, in Tallinn, on the plane I watched the movie Interstellar again, and I was, while I was thinking about these slides, I was thinking that the, this kind of the ambitious goal is like uh, solving the ultimate equation and control the gravity. I mean, so it's a, I know it's an ambitious goal, but it has been our main motivation. 
And from now on, I'll describe um, how we approached this problem and came up with a particular uh, practical uh, the solution. It may not be perfect. I cannot say that it's perfect. And, but I think it has many important implications. And it has achieved excellent results so far, along with some criticism, as expected. Uh, first of all, we had two target exercises. The first one is the Cyber Conflict Exercise, CCE, which is an annual uh, national attack defense exercise between 10 red teams and 16 blue teams. And one of the main battlefields there was the ICS SCADA network. And the other one is a well-known Lock Shield, hosted by the great, same great people who are hosting this great event. And that Lock Shield is the world's largest international live fire exercise, where there are more than 20 blue teams. And this it's game net has a lot of different special systems. We were part of providing one of the special systems. And considering that, the first and foremost the design consideration was scalability. We wanted to provide separate, identical, complete ISS SCADA systems and network to each uh, participating blue team. Because there are more than 20 teams, and we had to provide almost uh, 30, 30 the systems, uh, including the backups. And all the systems should be set up just before the exercise and dis disassembled right after the exercise. So that the mobility of ease of deployment was critical, unlike the usual cyber range setup. And even though it seems really obvious, uh, building a realistic exercise uh, environment was really emphasized. But the, the, the reality we focused on was the experience of the exercise participants, not the look of the simulation setup. And uh, that this platform had to have a leverage the, some technologies to extend, um, to uh, maximize the extensibility. Uh, regarding that, one of the early decision choice is to use the 3D printing technology uh, to best utilize the low volume production of various designs. And we also have some effective visualization means to represent the physical facilities and its damage caused by the cyber attack. And we want to pro, uh, support as many protocols or vendors, models, and so on. So achieving all this all together at, at once, uh, whether it's possible, but we had a uh, dream. And this is how we came up with. This is the architecture of the national, uh, NSR's ICS exercise platform. Sorry. Composed of three main components, control network layer, control system layer, and visualization layer. And reality, we focused on coming from the control network layer. Even though it looks a little bit simplified or generalized, um, it had all crucial common elements across many CI sectors. Uh, only if we, the scenario we are creating on this system or attack vectors uh, are seamlessly connected and uh, we, we are imitating the real life uh, really well, then we believe that the trainees will feel the great sense of reality uh, from that. There's actually a term for that, uh, willing suspension of disbelief, a concept that is widely used in the, any kind of storytelling, uh, including the serious, design, uh, serious game design. And the rest two, are implemented in hardware. And that is how it looks. I mean, left side, that shows the system diagram. On the right side, system uh, control system layer, 
it hosts two different PLC models. One is from the Korean vendor, the other one is from the European vendor. And there's a, one master switch to choose what to turn on at a time. And there are some actuators controlled by that PLC. And most unique feature of this system is the visual, visualization layer uh, in the 15 by 15 checkerboard shape on the left side. And it can hold 255 the LEDs or other digital modules. And on top of that, 3D printed diorama will be positioned like this. And the LEDs underneath it will show the normal state and the abnormal state. For example, when the blue is, uh, blue is I mean normal, then the red is, means something is going on. And as an optional technology, we also develop some augmented reality on top of the, this diorama. So with this platform, we de designed the city called Himang, which means hope in Korean. And it has three different CI sectors. Airport control, power grid control, nuclear power plant, water purification plant, traffic light control, and railroad control. On the left side, it shows the city district uh, composed of, and in the middle of it, there's a base site symbolizing each sector, surrounded by some residential or uh, the commercial district. <coughs> I mean, that's the, we represent the damage caused by the cyber attacks. And on the right side, it shows the HMI, the human machine interface that monitors and controls each <coughs> system. And this is how uh, it was the demo system that is used in the CCE and Lock Shields. On the right side, it is when the AR effect was uh, added on top of the diorama uh, to express the effect more vividly, more dramatically. So on both events, uh, Lock Shields and the CCE, this exercise platform attracted uh, attention as the most visible highlights. And it was scalable so that we could provide a separate, uh, identical, complete system, the ICS card network and system to each blue team. And it was mobile and durable and easy to deploy, covering four events for the last two years, going back and forth, South Korea and Estonia. And for CCE, we enabled the Korean vendor-based system, while for the Lock Shields, we enabled the European vendor-based system. And uh, in addition to six sectors, we just I just kind of we we co just co we already covered. We are still also working on the project to extend that further to cover the major critical infrastructure sector. Uh, designated by the Korean government. So as a conclusion, uh, in this study, we proposed how to construct the cyber physical battlefield platform for large scale uh, cyber security exercises. Our main goal is to develop a platform that maximize the various design considerations we just uh, discussed. And we want to leverage it as a tool to foster continuous innovation and the accumulation of knowledge around it. And as you just heard, it's a still ongoing project. Uh, please keep an eye on the, what we are working on uh, in the future. So with that, I conclude my talk. Thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to shoot. Thank you. <clears throat> Junzu, thank you very much uh, for bringing closer uh, to us uh, how uh, the cyber physical battlefield looks like, at least in the real life. And uh, 
Your relevance, uh, your questions are welcome. And so, actually, I was impressed when the uh, first time I saw your product, and uh, it was great. Uh, you mentioned two vendors, vendors that was uh, included into your product. Right. Is uh, this uh, is this uh, product uh, can be used for research purposes as well? I think. Uh, it depends. Uh, so, to develop this, I mean, we have gone through many kind of same procedures developing the test, the test beds for the research purposes in our the, the institute, National Security Research Institute. Uh, but the, this it has been developed to more suitable for the large scale uh, cyber security exercises. But uh, uh, if you build, uh, I mean, to, to make it more real, from now on, we'll focus on more the, the constructing the virtualize the, the control network more uh, realistic with the real the software used in the field. If you are kind of connecting and con configure them as close as the one in the real, real field, then uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure that we, I mean, it still can be used for the I mean, serious research uh, project as well. I see. So this is, is this the next step of your research? Oh, uh, depends. I mean, based on our um, resources, resource availability and the, uh, but uh, I mean, there are different way to go. I mean, the, we want to get the, make more, uh, co try to cover more areas where we can, we can fo put our effort to make the systems more realistic. Uh, uh, they are actually two different the extreme kind of directions. We are trying to uh, target both, but uh, let's see. How it goes. I totally agree with you. Yeah. We have to make some decisions uh, during um, the development of uh, cyber physical battlefield. Right. Is there any question from you? Not yet. So uh, yes, yes, we've got great. Sorry for the lights. I can't see you. On the right side. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, how many scenarios do you have in your system, or how will? Uh, how to define scenario? I mean, that's uh, another kind of problem. I mean, the maybe there are a lot of scenario you imagine. R right. Uh, if you if you define scenario as the attack vectors that the blue teams have to detect or kind of the prevent uh, from the red teams, I mean the there's no limitation of the number of the scenarios we can make up make on on top of it. But uh, for the Lux Shield 2019, um, frankly, for the 2000 Lux Shield 2018, delivering the system for the Lux Shields was our main target. Mm -hmm. But the, for the Luxus 2019, using the same platform, we try to develop more attack vectors. Mm -hmm. uh, majorly, the, the, the attack vectors may, is composed of more. I mean, the, even though it's a small kind of network system, composed of six VMs, historian, the uh, HMI, some the the PMS, and so on. Uh, then. Uh, for each system, we develop more than three or four, like you know, the vulnerabilities or misconfigurations uh, the red teams can leverage. So multiply by that. So around twenty. But this, it can be added. I mean, unlimited okay, number of times. So that. And one more question. Yeah. Uh, how do you evaluate the performance of the atten attendance people? Uh, the Say again. Oh, sorry. The, how how do you evaluate? Evaluate. Evaluate the uh, performance of uh, attendees or uh, the participants' people's uh, performance. Ah, uh, I um. If you are asking about the evaluation of the exercise participants yeah. or with the yeah. evaluation of how good was our system yeah, is, true. or I mean, evaluation is a big topic in exercise. I mean, uh. Evaluating as, as the participants' 
performance is another big the challenge, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, we can get the surveys, but the survey is too, uh, too superficial. We are trying to develop the method. I mean, the, I was uh, working in, uh, with Tallinn Tech here for the one year last year. Um, uh, and we are still kind of trying to develop the good way to evaluate the people. But uh, we, are, we are using the traditional tools, surveys, observations, and I um, mean, the, the analysis of their, the report, their reports, and so on. And, but uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> there are many ways to do yeah. that. But uh, I don't think there's a, it's a big, I mean, the perfect yeah. way to evaluate the, their performances. So, Thank you. Yeah. That's my frank answer for that. Thank you very Thank much. You so much. So uh, let me introduce our third uh, distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Armando Takela, who is an associate professor in information processing system in the University of Jona. He has a PhD in electrical and computer engineering his main research interest is the field of artificial intelligence with a focus to the application in safety and security of intelligence system. In 2007, Armando was awarded the Macro Sorminio Award for the best young Italian researcher in AI by the Italian Association of Artificial Intelligence. So please introduce your presentation. Thank you very much, Gabor, for an introduction. Uh, also, thanks for mentioning the prize. <laughs> I somehow uh, was in my CV. And uh, thank the organizer for having me here. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today to describe uh, the results of this research. Uh, I won't be uh, delving too much into figures and tables. You can find them in the paper. There will be some formulas. I hope it uh, will be just one slide. Uh, but let me uh, go and introduce uh, my agenda. So uh, after a little bit of introduction, I'm going to show you uh, about our case study, uh, the attack models that we tried, and how we mapped uh, process variables uh, to performance indexes, and how we extracted uh, our resilience indexes, and finally some uh, hints, some uh, extracts about our experimental results. OK, so uh, I think I don't have to go uh, about explaining what a critical infrastructure is to this audience uh, or whether resilience is an important topic. Uh, actually, these two definitions are taken from the Presidential Policy Directive uh, in February 2013 by President Obama. And these are kind of the polar stars for, for our research. And also, uh, for the motivation, so resilience is important, uh, and uh, uh, I have to admit it's a well-investigated topic. So there is a fairly vast uh, body of literature about uh, resilience, uh, and this the body of literature that we uh, investigated. Uh, that was our uh, task. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you will find uh, uh, resilience investigated uh, in a heterogeneous context, uh, going from the <coughs> protection of uh, uh, infrastructure from natural disasters, uh, uh, maybe societies, uh, control systems. Uh, little emphasis uh, is given to uh, cyber attacks, at least uh, until recently. <coughs> okay, the ultimate objective of our research uh, is to come up with something like the energy label for uh, buildings or appliances, okay? And I have to credit for the metaphor Brigadier General Francesco Vestito, who spoke uh, this morning, and he cooperates with this research, providing inspiration uh, and also motivation, I have to say. Uh, and the idea is that when you buy uh, an appliance, uh, you will get your energy label telling you that you know, the appliance is class A. And then, of course, what you might know is that uh, during usage, your energy consumption uh, uh, features might degrade because the appliance degrades. So uh, you get the label, but in fact, the label should be dynamic. 
And for resilience, it's pretty much the same in the sense that uh, you get some infrastructure and perhaps it's labeled A when it's new, everything works fine, uh, the infrastructure is not under attack, but then while the infrastructure is being operating, bad things may occur, and this is not just about uh, uh, cyber attacks, but you can have also the failure of some part of the infra infrastructure for natural causes. And if a cyber attack happens then, then you are in trouble. Or the other way around, you have, you have been attacked, the attack is not being disruptive in the sense that it's not causing anything really bad to happen, but then something uh, uh, natural occurs, like uh, some parts of your infrastructure is failing for natural causes, and then you are in trouble. Okay? So it is really important to get to uh, this kind of uh, uh, index, and uh, the, the index should be quantitative in the sense it should be grounded into precise measurement made out of the system. Uh, it should be model free, so it should not rely on the knowledge of the dynamics, precise knowledge of the dynamics of the system, uh, equations and so forth. Uh, and hopefully it should be general purpose in the sense that you should be able to apply it uh, to different kinds uh, of uh, infrastructure. Of course, these goals I realize are fairly ambitious. You might not be able to attain all three of them contemporarily, but at least this is what we are aiming to. Okay, so uh, our case study is about a wastewater treatment facility. It's not the one in the picture. Uh, this one is located in India and it's not the one we studied. We cannot disclose uh, the location and the details of the one we studied. And uh, wastewater and water treatment are part of uh, national critical infrastructure. Um, and the reason why attacking a wastewater treatment facility uh, might be uh, useful for an attacker is not just because if you manage to have the tanks overflow, you're going to uh, realize it very soon, not because of the smell, but essentially uh, most uh, wastewater treatment facilities have systems that prevent that to occur, and essentially they do it by dumping uh, untreated water, I mean, untreated sewage to the, to the sea. In this case, the, the facility dumps at sea. Uh, and this may get dangerous because uh, if uh, the bacteria contained and the other substances contained in sewage get to the sea, that may cause serious illnesses problem. So in fact, you have a cheap uh, chemical weapon at your disposal if you manage to attack a wastewater facility. Wastewater facilities used to be very low automation uh, plants till a few years ago, but now with the uh, uh, growing digitalization, they are becoming more and more automated. So the opportunity for a successful attack is, is also growing. Uh, in our analysis, we considered uh, uh, um, an abstract model of uh, the wastewater facility, um, which is run using the software MATLAB. Um, but we are using uh, historical data and real dimensions from, from the plant. So we are trying to get uh, as, real, uh, as, as close as possible to the real uh, installation, but having a, a, a simulation um, clone of the real plant allows us to run simulation, uh, repeated simulation, each time altering some parameters so that we can analyze uh, what happens on average. Okay, so... Uh, Critical infrastructure is different. I mean, different, you can uh, get your wastewater treatment facility. You can have uh, um, electrical power plants, uh, electricity distribution, communication networks. But uh, at the very core of each automation system, uh, you have the feedback loop, right? So you have some control system which uh, constantly uh, observes uh, the physical process, uh, extracts from the physical process some uh, relevant parameters, uh, and then uh, uses uh, the feedback uh, obtained from the, from the system in order to control it and keep it uh, to the desired uh, position. So for instance, in a wastewater treatment facility, you have control on several things, the level of the tanks, uh, the flow between tanks, uh, which in some cases must be maintained uh, at a certain specific uh, rate, uh, the gas, the quantity of gases uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the facility, although we do not model it, but that's also an important uh, uh, thing to be controlled. 
And now, if you look at the, at the feedback control loop, uh, you realize that there are essentially three ways uh, in which an attacker can do harm. Uh, one is uh, by altering the, the, the setting points. The other one is uh, by altering the regulator parameters, so changing the way the regulator interacts with the system. And the third one is uh, by uh, disturbing the feedback. Okay? And in fact, uh, in our uh, study, we looked at the uh, um, possibility of an attacker changing uh, the set point. And we also try to uh, have attack models that change the set point without causing uh, uh, the triggering of any alarm. Okay? So is there a possibility to attack the system uh, without being noticed? So for instance, without triggering any overflow alarm? And this is uh, the next question is, of course, whether we can spot this uh, event <laughs> just by looking at our resilience indexes. Okay. Uh, when you see a system, you just see uh, process variables, process data, the level of tanks, uh, the quantity of gases, and so on and so forth, as measured by your system. Uh, these are not the performance indicator themselves. They need to be mapped into performance indicators. Okay? So for doing that, you need some figure of merit function. The task of a figure of merit function is to map process variables into performance, let's say 0 to 1. Uh, this is known in the literature. Uh, what we have introduced uh, is uh, uh, a notion of model-free figure of merit function. What is the idea? The idea is that uh, in order to build, to map from process data to uh, performance indicators, we don't want to use uh, the dynamics of the system. We don't want to know the dynamics of the system. We just need to know what are the desirable values for each uh, process variable. So if you are close to a desirable value, then your performance is maximum. If you are far, if you get far from a desired value, then your performance becomes smaller. Uh, of course, uh, you don't need no model, but uh, you need uh, to have data, and you need to know about the system requirements. And you'll need to change the form function when the system or the process variable change. Okay? So you cannot hope to have a, a single form function that works for each process variable for each system. This is something that you will have to adapt. But now, once you have done that, then you can look uh, at things in the abstract plane of performance. Okay? And in the abstract plane of performance, things go as, uh, as in the picture. Uh, you have some baseline performance, then some event occurs, the performance is degraded, and then eventually it resumes normal operation, if you're lucky, or the system goes to a, a faulty state. Now, uh, again, this is not uh, our invention. Uh, it's, it's known in the literature, uh, and there are lots of proposals there. Uh, actually, uh, even if most proposals are about uh, quantitative evaluation of resilience, many are not general purpose in the sense they, they were developed for specific uh, plants, uh, specific infrastructures. And there is little experimental work uh, on assessing whether one uh, um, index or the other is, is better for, for the task at hand. OK, this, this is the only slide uh, with formulas, as I promised. Uh, these are the actual indexes that we tested. As we see, they are very abstract. There is no reference to, to speci any specific system. For instance, if we take the, the first one, the psi A index, we see that what we do, uh, we take uh, the control period when we have the event, the disruptive event occurs. We map a given process variable, x A of t in the, in the slide, to the performance plane using the form function. Okay, So we go from process variable to the performance plane. And now we just compute the integral of that, of that mapping. Uh, if the integral is 1, then your system is fine. You are resilient. If there is some performance degradation, then the numerator of that fraction will be less than 1. And so you will notice some decrease in the index. The index is 0 if your system reached the 0 performance level that we want to avoid. Now, I, I won't go into the details uh, of all the other indexes. You can find them in the paper. But essentially, the idea is always the same. You have some uh, uh, performance during uh, 
normal operation, which means that you are possibly being attacked or possibly some adverse events are occurring. And then you have some baseline performance that you are using uh, to compare your normal operations with. Um, there's only one index uh, that uh, is based on a slightly different concept. It's the index that we call Psi C. And that is based on the difference between the, the maximum performance drop and the avoided drop uh, of, your, of your event. We also introduced a new index, which is a sort of a combination between uh, the second and the first resilience index. Uh, in particular, the first resilience index requires the estimation of the attack period which might be hard to obtain, whereas the last one index that we introduced uh, is based on the observation period. So it provides a consistent over approximation. OK. One last question uh, about system-wide resilience. So far, we have been able to map a process variable to the performance plane and then to compute an index which is specific for that uh, process variable. If you want to summarize many variables, then you need some, some way to do that. So you need the form functions, you need the resilience indexes, and you need some combination rules. Uh, as we discussed in the paper, there are several ways to do that. Uh, in the paper, we adopted a very simple but not entirely satisfactory weakest link rule. So we estimate the global resilience based on the lowest resilience index obtained on several process variables. But there are different ways of doing that, and they are uh, subject of our current investigation. OK, so how did we perform experimental analysis? Using our MATLAB model, we injected an attack to the regulator parameters. For the specific kind of attack that we tried, uh, this is the same as if we were disturbing the feedback uh, signal. So in fact, we. Uh, we can say that we tried two out of the three possible attacks. Uh, and we have different parameters uh, of our attack, the duration of the attack, the frequency of the attack, the, the width. So essentially, we are injecting a, a stray signal into, uh, uh, into our regulator and see uh, what the effects are, considering our indexes. Again, the, the facts and the figures uh, are in the paper. Here, I want just to focus uh, on some key findings that, that we had. But of course, you're free to ask me questions even offline. OK, the first result that we obtained is that, yes, uh, you can be silent in your attack, so you can bring degradation to your system without being noticed. In particular, if you use uh, uh, an attack which has some frequency and some width, um, you will manage not to overflow tanks, so you will not trigger alarms. But still, you will be probably managed to waste uh, the pump that is controlling the, the, the height of the tank. Okay? And this is because uh, you are keeping the pump uh, in a continuous transient mode, which is, uh, for electrical motors, very bad. So yes, uh, you can be silent, and yes, uh, you can damage your system. But what is more important is that our indexes reveal that in the sense that you will see indexes based on the level of the tanks stay the same, whereas indexes based uh, on the uh, uh, pump activity will, will change uh, and will uh, show a decrease in the resilience of the system. Notice that this may occur also for natural causes. Now, it is unlikely that such an attack uh, happens for natural causes, but other attacks, like those uh, that where you have a single step variation, may also be due to a single stack at fault. But those are also detected from our, from our indexes. So you, you can estimate uh, the overall resilience of your system. Um, we are also very happy because we found out some new proxy indexes. In particular, as I showed you before, we introduced a new index which, is not, which does not require the estimation of the period of the attack, but still works pretty well in uh, defining the resilience of the systems when compared to more precise, uh, precise indexes. And of course, there's room for improvement here. So this was just a first attempt. We also got some negative results in the sense that some of the indexes that we found in the literature did not prove to be so well suited in order, even with this simple model, in order to establish the resilience of a system in a, in a, in a coherent way. Okay. And then I uh, come with the to the conclusions. Uh, so this work involved the analysis of uh, more than 40 papers, about 46. Actually, uh, I have to credit uh, my collaborator, 
Jo Murinov for doing this. She's in the audience, so if you want to know about the 40 and plus paper, you can ask her. She will tell you about them. <laughs> and essentially, these were all the papers we managed to lay our hands on. Uh, of course, if you look at the paper and see that we are missing something, uh, then we are happy to, to discuss with you further references. We proposed the model free linear form functions. So we have this concept of mapping from uh, the space of process data to performance variables that is completely system independent and can be tailored to any system. Of course, here we went with linear functions. You can you know, be more uh, creative uh, and uh, uh, think about nonlinear, hyperbolic, Gaussian functions. So uh, room for improvement exists. We evaluated general purpose indexes, and we mean general purpose because uh, once you mapped from process variable to performance plane, then you are completely general purpose. I mean, this is a wastewater treatment facility, but you could have been an energy production plant. We had this weakest link uh, system-wide evaluation proposal. It's not entirely satisfactory yet. We are investigating uh, further improvements, and uh, we found out significant difference also in terms of statistical tests when looking at the indexes and uh, considering the same attack or uh, among different attacks uh, considering the same index. I would like to thank uh, our uh, facility provider, University of Genoa. Um, Sparta project uh, is to be thanked for supporting the activity of our co-author, Professor Alessandro Armando. Leonardo sponsored this, uh, this study. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned before, the Ministry of Defense, which provided uh, constant uh, push, motivation, and support uh, for this study to be accomplished. And so we have to thank all these people if you are here today to present this work. Thank you very much for your attention. Professor, thank you very much for your comprehensive and very, very nice presentation. Uh, I would like you to have some question. No? Okay, so when I went through the articles, both of them, I was pretty sure that uh, they will uh, connect it to the, to the real life, uh, the communication, the cyber battlefield, and, uh, and I was a little bit shocked when I saw yours, because uh, it's, it's a kind of theoretical stuff. So uh, I, I didn't know how will I connect it to the real life, and I found the solution. I would ask you, tell me, how can we use this uh, kind of method, this approach in a real uh, system that uh, actually exists to improve the security level? Yes. Thanks for the question. So, uh, well, the idea is that uh, uh, you could estimate uh, your, your indexes while the system is uh, performing under normal operation. So you know that your system is uh, not being attacked, that your system is not being subject to any uh, faults or uh, other kind of accidents. And this can be done, of course, in the setup phase. And then once you obtain uh, baseline data, you can operate your system and uh, keep on acquiring process data and keep computing your indices and comparing it with the baseline. If you see any significant uh, difference in terms of statistical uh, tests, and you can perform these tests uh, online, uh, then you can raise a flag uh, and say, look, there might be an issue here. Clear, clear. So please, I would like you to bring the microphone, microphone in the middle. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, is uh, there a possibility to, to represent also this kind of cascading failure, or do, do the indexes help there when you have many, many kind of facilities and, and they have some, some links between them? All right. We are working on that. We are going to publish, uh, oh, sorry, not to publish, <laughs> to submit a paper by the end of June, uh, which deals exactly with this issue of cascading failures. It was a topic that we started to look at uh, since the very beginning, but we had to separate concerns because uh, that was uh, uh, also difficult in, in, on its own, but uh, we, are, we are investigating that. So we hope to be able to provide the means uh, 
to extract uh, system-wide resilience indexes uh, starting from the calculation that we have done here. We are not yet there. We are working in that direction. Is there any more question for this uh, particular presentation? No, I would like you to uh, put the microphone in the middle because we had a question related to the first presentation. Please. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> you had this wonderful stack of trust, these four mm -hmm. blocks with the hardware, trustworthy hardware at the bottom. Uh, because I think uh, uh, it's clear uh, without trustworthy hardware, everything else is void. Um, if you look at this level, I'm not very uh, happy because uh, we use computers uh, for computing and we use it for com communications. If you look on the computing side, we have uh, now almost two decades broken hardware design for all computing CPUs, being them from Intel or AMD which was uncovered uh, uh, when Spectre and Meltdown was published. Um, and I don't see there's a fix for it unless making them five times slower, five times slower. Um, and on the, on the communications part, we have the situation that uh, we have suppliers here in the world, the big suppliers where we have fundamental uh, problems uh, with the trust in this supply chain. Uh, so how do we get out of this trap? Uh, Mike is on, yeah. Um, so the uh, yeah the hardware or the chipset vulnerabilities have been a, a very interesting headache for for a couple of years now, and uh, I think that for that as to any other security weakness that we deal with, and we deal with a few of them every day, um, considering the hundreds of different products and and different types of technologies that we integrate into them. Uh, it is just about the matter of your own procedures. So you need to be having a very good vulnerability management. You have to have a very prompt patch management system. So I actually making sure that we secure all those layers in a, in a structured manner. I don't think that there is a uh, bulletproof solution for having a magical hardware that never is broken or is never found vulnerable, either neither in software. Uh, that's the same case. Uh, what comes to trust uh, of the supply chains, uh, I can of course only speak from our own behalf and uh, in, in, that, in that matter we are trying to work our best telling about these things, telling what is happening, uh, showing what are good processes, what we have found working for us for last 20 plus years, uh, securing our systems. So, we have published uh, plenty of those papers. Uh, actually, a guide for 5G network security is downloadable from our ericsson.com page. It is a very kind of easy to read, human readable. I, I say not, uh, you don't need to be an engineer or, or a professor. You can actually read it if you're, if you're just a guy. And, um, and it explains how the whole security of a future 5G network actually works from bottom up, uh, starting from the standards. Uh, I recommend reading those and then, then start uh, forming on what are all those factors that actually Im, um, have an implication in the full trustworthiness of the, of the network. We're also putting uh, information about uh, incident response and the security reliability model and many of those into the public domain now that, that uh, people can have a read and understand how these processes work in, in a telco industry. Command question. Yes, please, on the right side. Hi. Um, so I was curious when you talked about the challenges of getting the equipment for doing the exercises and also the diversity of the uh, kind of systems that Ericsson tests as well, so kind of the first two speakers. Um, do you all feel that the diversity of implementation and kind of the differences in critical infrastructure systems make them more defensible, or do you think that that makes it harder to design defense systems for them? Should I answer first? Or <laughs> yes, the, di diversity of um, uh, the solutions in, in the uh, infrastructure. That's uh, how does that uh, apply to the... Uh, uh, challenge of defending. I, yeah, I guess. I mean, any uh, IT information technology system you have, uh, 
you have to have appropriate defenses for different types of systems. So telecommunication system as such is a little bit different from uh, some other uh, uh, systems because you have to have, uh, for example, the, the, the uh, reliability and the robustness of, of the whole uh, network is a super important part of the whole end-to-end uh, 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 -end picture you have to always have a ability to call the emergency numbers. You cannot just give a, a in in that and take a, make a risk assessment that we can actually just have a emergency calls every second day. It, it has to be always on. So uh, in that sense, I would say that, yeah, it's complex. It's not easy uh, to, to secure a, a very versatile, a very diverse system. But um, it takes time and resources, and uh, I'm glad to be quite confident that the, the whole industry has actually a good history in making secure systems. So uh, I have no doubt about our success in the future also. So yeah, I agree that the diversity of the system makes uh, us to hard harder to defend. As an exercise, exercise planner, we do have to have a two-track uh, approach for the, the special kind of the systems, we have to have a very realistic system that we have to prepare some very customized exercise to train the really expert on, on this field. But the, in, uh, the, the platform I kind of introduced was the, uh, the other track of strategy I was, we are targeting to have more, uh, extract some common elements across the uh, CI sector so that the, any expert in the field, I mean the security, the minded the uh, technicians comes and kind of easily learn the basic setup mm -hmm. and get the fundamental the idea of the systems of the, the I mean the c control ISIS uh, SCADA network and try to op apply some general generic the, the defense mechanism about it so that the, we do, did, do have to have a portfolio of the exercise to cover mm -hmm. both, mm -hmm. both areas. Professor, some comment? Um, so I wouldn't uh, know what to add about uh, what has been said, uh, but one, one, one thing that we are looking into is uh, uh, trying to uh, seek uh, results on different uh, infrastructure. Now, of course, we have this single case study. We are already working on uh, microgrids, which represent an interesting uh, uh, test bed, uh, and we are also considering uh, data centers as a potential for uh, for for cyber attacks. So uh, it is clear that uh, in order to get uh, a complete picture, we need to look at as many uh, different kinds of infrastructure as we can. There there are 16 uh, different categories, if I remember it correctly, in the DHS uh, uh, document at least. Uh, so it will take us. Uh, uh, some time to do that. Hopefully, if we manage it to be um, general purpose and uh, <laughs> as we as we want it to be, uh, once we uh, uh, start working with some some of them, we'll gain momentum. It will be easier to deal uh, with the, with the rest of them once we have a good knowledge of uh, some uh, mo the, the most important, the most pressing uh, of them. Thank you very much. Uh, I know we almost run out of the time, but uh, first of all, I, I would like to have a question to the gentleman in the middle. Would your question related to the panel? Okay, thank you very much. So as, uh, as you can see, we had a very balanced, uh, balanced uh, panel now with the representative of the industry, the applied and academic uh, science. I hope that you enjoyed the time here, and uh, each and every one uh, here has something to take away. Thank you for uh, your presence, and I hope that you will enjoy the day. See you next time. <laughs>